Hey friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. And today is a very special episode. It is part two of my speaker uh, wall of fame, hall of fame choices based on my 30 plus years of being in the audio business in one form or another. And uh, I've heard hundreds, probably over a thousand speakers. And this, these are the ones that stood out. And today's episode is about speakers that sell for over a thousand dollars a pair. Some are new, some are current speakers, some are vintage speakers. They really uh, run the gamut. And first up is a speaker I reviewed just last year, and it's the Ohm Walsh 2000. It's very special, and it stands out because it's an omnidirectional speaker, meaning it's spreading sound or filling your room with sound, and I think it's a 300 degree uh, dispersion. So unlike box speakers that push sound forward or panel speakers that push sound forward and back, the Ohm Walsh 2000 is omnidirectional. And when you hear that, if you've never heard it, uh, it's a, it's changes you around because <laughs> you say, wait, that doesn't sound like a speaker, that sounds like real life. It's that kind of thing. Just the way it fills a room. And as an added bonus, it sounds good when placed near a wall. It's designed for near wall placement, meaning I think six, eight inches, 10 inches away from the wall where uh, most box speakers and panel speakers, two, three feet is, is better, but not the Ohm Walsh 2000. Close wall placement is, uh, is advised. So second on my list here is uh, the Epos ES14, classically British speaker, but with a twist or two. For one, it doesn't have a crossover on the mid woofer driver. That driver goes directly to your amplifier. I should say your amplifier is connected directly to that driver. So it has a very direct sound. And uh, the tweeter though has a cap. So it has a minimalist crossover and it ha the sound is enticingly clear. So another, next up on my list is a speaker that's both vintage and current, the Vandersteen 2C. Now, I sold them back in the 80s and 90s at Sound by Singer. Large, uh, not large, but good size, floor standing speaker, an open baffle design, open baffle for the uh, mid-range and tweeter, extremely open sounding speaker, very full sounding speaker, very, very, very popular speaker. So the, 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 the 2C is still made and uh, it's, it looks just like it did in the 70s. It sounds better, there have been revisions along the way but it is an outstanding speaker and uh, it gets points just for being in there for the long haul. Very, very impressive speaker. I'm gonna talk about two speakers now that I owned and not only owned, but they both stuck around for a long time in, in my system. The first one was the Snell Type A Improved. It was the second version of the Snell A. A very large, for the, especially for the time, floor standing speaker very even tempered speaker. It didn't do anything exceptionally well. It just did everything very well. I just loved that speaker. I owned it for eight years. Uh, Mrs. Audiophiliac loved that speaker as well. She was very disappointed when I decided to sell it. That's a whole other story, but it stuck around for about eight years. So the, the second speaker that stuck around for a long time, also around eight years in this apartment, was the Quad ESL 63, an electrostatic speaker, very advanced design, very, very, very transparent, great imaging speaker, just a beautiful sounding speaker. The only catch, and the reason that I eventually sold it, was that it was not a dynamic speaker. It was not a good speaker for, let's say, for rock music or any big, for me, dynamic music. So it, it, it left, it left the premises, and uh, you know what, I, I think I'm done with electrostatic speakers. I had one, I lived with it for a long time, I tweaked it, I did all sorts of things with that speaker. But I basically got that out of my system and I don't think I'll be returning to electrostatic speakers that I, bought, that I buy at least, uh, probably forever. <laughs> so anyway. So the speaker that followed the quad was this one, the Gallo reference. Now, as you can see, it's a little unusual, right? Those are two aluminum uh, spheres. They're about 12 inches in diameter. The drivers in them are six inch Dynaudio drivers. But on top of the speaker, that little hat is a, is a proprietary um, 
omnidirectional tweeter. It was designed and made in Brooklyn, not far from me, by Anthony Gallo. And I love that speaker. And as I said, it was, it was a great transition speaker to move away from electrostatics to dynamic speaker because it had some mm, electrostatic-like qualities. It was a very fast sounding speaker. It imaged really, really well. But it had more, pardon the expression, balls than, <laughs> than, the, than the quad did. So it was, it was, I loved that speaker. The next speaker, I'm not sure if it followed immediately after the Gallo or the JM Lab Mini Utopia. Now JM Lab is still around, but that company is now called Focal. Focal, JM Lab, same thing. And the Mini Utopia was a mini version of the Utopia, meaning the, the mid-range and tweeter were the same as the ones in the Utopia, but the Utopia also had base drivers that the Mini Utopia lacked. Now the Grand Utopia was $70,000 at that point, and this one was five or $6,000, and I just added a subwoofer so I had some of the base that was missing, although you could use the Mini Utopia as a full range speaker. That one stuck around for a long time. I really liked that speaker. I had a set of wavelength, uh, single-ended triodes with those, with 300 Bs. Really, really, really just incredible speaker made in France and just very, it was a very satisfying experience living with that speaker. Then came, well, skipping ahead in time, uh, the Bowers and Wilkins 805D3, in other words, with a diamond tweeter. Fast, transparent, very open, uh, an enjoyable speaker. But for one reason or another, it, it didn't stick around here that long. It was replaced with the TAD ME1. But the, but the ME1 is made in Japan, and it's kind of a, it's a monitor-oriented design, designed by Andrew Jones. No, actually... No, it wasn't designed. It was, it was as he was leaving. He sort of had some part in that, but not, not the whole thing. Anyway, uh, the ME1 was a monitor speaker for audiophiles. Sounds like a great idea, and it was. It was high, high, high resolution, great clarity, great extension on the bottom for, for its size, um, and just beautiful, beautiful in a Japanese audiophile sort of way. Uh, that one was here for about a year and a half or so, maybe two years. Now, I think what replaced, I'm pretty sure what replaced the ME1 was the Klipsch Forte 3, the, the ongoing experiment of Steve living with big horn speakers. And that one was large, 12 inch woofer, 15 inch passive radiator on the back of it. Fun, really dynamic, really exciting, and just a blast to live with. That one was replaced with the current speaker that's here for a, on a long-term uh, loan basis, and that is the Klipsch Cornwall 4, which is even bigger <laughs> than the Forte. It has a 15-inch woofer. No passive radiator is required. A bigger mid-range horn, and just a blast. A blast to live with because it's so dynamic, it's so alive, it's so free and low in distortion and clear. Just a fun, highly engaging speaker. And that's, I'm going to be repeating myself a lot because that to me is, that's the most important quality for a speaker to have. In other words, if you turn it around, a speaker that's not engaging means it's kind of boring or it's fatiguing or something. You're just, yeah, not that into it, right? But a speaker that keeps pulling you in, I want to hear more, I want to hear more, I want to hear more, is engaging. And that's, that's what I want from a speaker that I'm living with over the long term. I've skipped around here. Now I'm going to go backwards and talk about the MagnaPan 3.6 and the MagnaPan 3.7. I had both. They're very similar, very large, like six feet tall panel speakers with a true ribbon tweeter. Uh, very, very transparent, very fast, and very open and very unbox-like. And again, I have to say, if, you, if you're an audiophile with some years on your, uh, on your odometer, and you've never lived with a MagnaPan, you should, because it's such a different experience than living with a box speaker. Now, most audiophile speakers are boxes of some form, right? But if you've never lived with a panel, an electrostatic speaker, or a, a planar magnetic speaker like these, 
you got to do it because it's just a different trip, not hearing sound coming out of a box. They are made uh, in Minnesota by Craftsman Who Care. I think they're beautifully constructed, but not elegant. And if anything, I think their prices <laughs> are too low for what you get. I don't think people take them seriously enough because they're not crazy expensive. The next speaker is one I, I never owned, but I wanted to. I just never pulled the trigger, which in retrospect was a really good idea. And it was the Stax F81, smallish uh, electrostatic speaker made in Japan, hyper, uber transparent, but no dynamics whatsoever. Just a, a very quiet speaker, a, listen, a speaker that you listen to quietly and just were absorbed. You listen to an acoustic guitar or solo voice or, wow, just stunning reproduction. It just had severe limitations, which is a, the reason I didn't buy it and I'm really happy. I never did, but I listened to it a lot because I, I sold them, so I knew it well. And that was, that's one for the, for the, if you're the right kind of person or you have, you know, lucky enough to have more room, you know, multiple systems at any one time, and you want to just listen to the F81 for what it does well, wow. So they're on the market. They're not insanely expensive. I sold another, another planner speaker is the, the Apogee, another U.S. company. I sold them for years and years at Sound by Singer. I was drawn, of all their models, I think my favorite was one far from their most expensive. It was called the du Duetta basically a two-way, meaning a, a woofer mid-range panel and a separate tweeter. And it just had a coherency, uh, uh, an organic quality. It was reasonably fast, but not super fast. But yeah, I, I really liked that speaker. I was never really tempted to buy it, but it was one of those that when I had nothing better to do at the store, which was rare, I would sit and listen to duettas because they were, they were special. Another speaker I had around here on a long-term loan for years and years was the Zoo Druid 4. Made in Utah, 10-inch full-range driver with a separate super tweeter, and very sensitive, easy to drive, extremely dynamic. The 10-inch driver was paper, made in the U.S. I think both drivers were made in the U.S. The speaker is made entirely in the U.S. Sean Casey's the designer, just high engagement factor, beautiful looking. I love the proportions of that speaker. In those days, Zoo painted their speakers and mine had this beautiful Ferrari red finish. I love that speaker. That was one, yeah, when I packed it up to return it, I did have a tear because Zoo is one of those companies that I think really, really, really jumps out of the deck. Well, next up is a speaker that wasn't around here very long but it made a huge impression on me was the Pure Audio Project Trio 15 Classic. Very large speaker, open baffle speaker with exposed 15 inch woofers, four of them in the stereo pair, uh, just massively open, the fastest, cleanest bass I've ever heard in this room and just did scale and life-size imaging Fun, whew, massive fun. Great company, based in Israel, ships all over the world, obviously, and just great people. And that is definitely one I'd like to spend more time with, more Pure Audio Project speakers, and I'm sure that will happen. The P3, the Harbeth, getting ahead of myself, the Harbeth P3 ESR 40th anniversary, small British, very, very British stand mount speaker sort of like in the vein of an LS35A. And I've heard many variants of LS35A speakers over the years. Mm, they just didn't work in the rooms that I've had. But for some reason, the Harbeth P3 ESR 40th anniversary and the standard P3 ESR, I love that speaker. Wow, it's, it's a, an apartment-sized speaker. You live in a small space, you can't have room for big speakers, but you want really high performance. You want tone, you want humans to sound like humans, you want guitars to sound like guitars. Great imaging, wonderful, wonderful speaker. And that's <laughs> definitely deserves a spot here in the Hall of Fame.
Oh, Dyn Audio. Now I had, I got into Dyn Audio speakers in like in a sideways approach. And that is I was doing home theater reviews for home theater magazine and also doing speaker reviews and stuff. And I needed a speaker that excelled with both home theater, meaning explosions and special effects and stuff, and also was one I would want to listen to music on. And I looked around the landscape. This is in the early 2000s. And it was clear that I needed to live with Dyn Audio speakers. And I had Dyn Audio contours for, for a bunch of years that, had, that served that double duty of home theater and music. And then I stepped up to the Dyn Audio Special 25, their 25th anniversary special edition speaker. And that was one of my references here for, I don't know, five, six, seven years or something. Great speaker, great company, made in Denmark. Uh, they make their drivers themselves. You know, a lot of, a lot of high-end speaker companies don't actually make the drivers that are, in their, that are in their speakers. You know, Wilson Audio, as much as I admire them, they don't actually make drivers. Dyn Audio does. But Dyn Audio makes all of the drivers in their speakers in-house, and they can tweak them to be used in specific models. So the tweeter might look the same in a bunch of different models, but each model gets a specially let's say calibrated, especially designed tweeter for that application. So anyway, I had these Dyn Audio tw Special 25s for years. And that's another one. I got to get back to Dyn Audio, spend more time with Dyn Audio speakers. But speaking of Wilson, on this list of speakers that loom large in my life are the er early Wilson Watt puppies, Watt 3, third generation Watt, and Puppy to the second generation Puppy. And there's a speaker that was very expensive. I could never afford them at the time. And this was before I was a reviewer. I would, I would come to the store early, bring some records with me that I wanted to listen to, and just sit in the chair and luxuriate in the sound of the Watt 3 Puppy 2. And I, I kept thinking, you know, well, now they're not that expensive on the used market. They go for about $5,000, $6,000 a pair. But they're, they're, they're relatively big and they're extremely heavy, so I just can't have them here just to, for, for fun and games. But someday, someday I'm going to live with early Watt Puppy speakers. I think so. So I'm going to finish up with a speaker I just reviewed not that long ago, and that is the new version of the KEF LS50, the LS50 Meta. Now, before the Meta came out, the LS50 was definitely going to be on this, on this list on, in the Hall of Fame. But the Meta comes out, and though it looks pretty much identical to the original LS50, it sounds so much better. It's so much more transparent. It is so open, pure, great mid-range, just an amazing speaker for a very, very reasonable price by high-end standards, $1,500 a pair. And amazingly enough, it's the same price as the original LS50, which debuted, I think, in 2012. So hats off to Kef for making this incredible speaker even better. So that concludes my, 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 my nominees for the Hall of Fame. And, uh, well, I want to hear about yours. So please list them below. And please... Talk about speakers that you've lived with or heard a lot, you know, let's say at your friend's house or something, not just something you read a review or watched a review about, something that you have direct experience with. Anyway, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This continues to be the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you like it, please subscribe. We're coming up to 150,000 subscribers probably by early November. Uh, but while you're here, you should check out the Patreon at P. A T R E O N dot com slash audiophiliac. And there's playlists for speaker reviews, about 90 or so speaker reviews on this channel, and speaker reviews I did forever at CNET and before that, Home Theater Magazine and Sound and Vision, all sorts of stuff that's out there by moi. But my work here now is at last complete. Thank you so much for watching. And I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.